In the interview you're about to listen to, I had the privilege to speak with the author, Gregory Zuckerman, who wrote the book, The Man Who Solved the Market, The Story of Jim Simons. Simons is considered by many people to be the best trader who's ever lived, which is obviously noteworthy itself, but the story of how he got there is even crazier. Throughout our conversation, you're going to get unique insights into Simons, the man who launched the quant revolution, and I'd also be willing to bet that it'll change how you look at your own trading. I hope you enjoy. <music> How are you doing today? Very excited to have this conversation. Doing well, thanks, and uh, nice to be here. I just finished this book. This is the book right here, so everyone can see it. This is The Man Who Solved the Market, How Jim Simons Launched the Quant Revolution. I read it. My jaw was on the ground. It was one of these books. You pick it up. I couldn't put it back down, and it's just such a new, unique way to look at the market, at least relative to what's pitched. And I just want to let you know, if you like, ask you if you knew these stats. So in the period that Jim was, I think from 1988 up until 2021, this is where I could find the metrics. I don't even know if you knew this. So at that period, if you invested in the S&P 500, $1 would have turned into 40. If you invested with Warren Buffett, that $1 would have turned into about 150. So like a very, very good return. If you put that dollar with Renaissance Technologies and specifically the Medallion Fund, that $1 would have turned into 42,000. That when I read that, I it blew my mind. He was a hundred a thousand X better than the spy and 250 X better than Warren Buffett, who we all consider a legend, absolutely crushing it across the board. So like it, it, it just truly blew my mind. And obviously you documented his story and you had a lot of, I guess, access that a lot of other people in this world have been trying to get, but they don't. But I mean, with those numbers, did you find that surprising at all going into it afterwards? I guess like what's your first reactions to when I say numbers that are just that wild? So I wasn't surprised because that's sort of why I started this project. He is the greatest, this guy, Jim Simons, the greatest, I don't know what you call him, a trader, speculator. I just call him moneymaker. He's not really an investor, but he's the biggest moneymaker in Wall Street history. And he was always sort of out there. I've been writing about Wall Street for, for years. I've been in the Wall Street Journal since 1996. And I always kind of wanted to tell his story. And people always said, don't waste your time. He's too secretive. I reached out to Jim. He said, I won't talk to you. This was years ago. And then I finally, I'm like, you know what? I, I just got to write this thing. So the numbers are the reason I wrote the story. They're crazy. They're improbable. They don't make sense. Um, they, they've never had a down year, let alone uh, maybe a month or two here or there, a down month. And, and we're talking decades and decades. So yeah, he by far is the most productive, most successful uh, moneymaker in Wall Street history. Astounding. You kind of just said there uh, the difficulty of reaching out to him. I I'm chuckling to myself because I can't even just imagine reaching out to a billionaire. Like even that part, like I know he's specifically difficult, but even that and like that's obviously going to be somewhat of a privilege of your position and your like body of work. But overall, like that in itself is why I love like, oh, I try to reach out to the billionaire. But could you share with the audience a little bit of that story? Because obviously, as it was explained in your book, that itself was difficult. And many, many people told you, like, don't even waste your time trying. Yeah, it's the hardest thing I ever did in, in my life. Oh. Um, I remember when I finished the book, I'm fast forwarding here, I kind of pressed the button and went upstairs from my office, told my wife, I'm done. I am done. I can't write another book again. I can't think of this thing again. That was the hardest effing thing I ever did in my life. So yeah, so he, it's a secretive firm they have these like 30, 40 page NDAs. If anybody talks, you get fired. They've gone after people in court. Um, I started doing the research and talking to Jim's rivals, other firms that do what they do. Uh, it's not really high frequency, but it's, it's quant trading, quantitative trading. And I would set up these meetings. And then like the night before, I get a text, hey, Greg, I can't meet with you. And I'm like, well, we were supposed to meet. Why, why can't you talk? Oh, Jim asked me not to talk to you. And I'm like, Jim's your rival. He's your competitor. Why do you care what he thinks? No, no, it's Jim Simons. I, I, I can't piss him off, Greg. It was like a, like a mafia Don kind of thing. You don't want to piss off Jim Simons. Wow. So people, even the, the competitors would talk to me. And then people at the firm People want to talk to me. There, there's a guy there I've talked to for years just about markets and, and what's going on at Wall Street or whatever. We'd have lunch once in a while. And he wouldn't even return my emails when he heard that I, I started this project. 
So I'm like, what am I doing here? And even like halfway through the, the book, as you'll see, I've got, to, I got some really good stuff about the early history of the of Renaissance and even the medium, medium years. I was literally losing sleep at night. I'm like, well, why is someone going to pay 30 bucks for this book if I can't get people inside the firm today? And, and I need those people. And why would those people talk to me? These people make millions and millions, not just salary, whatever bonus, but just investing in this fund. And why would they talk to me? They're going to blow their chance to, they'll get, they'll, they'll get fired, potentially get fired. There's the risk reward doesn't make sense. Why would they talk to Zuckerman uh, about the book when, when, when they jeopardize their job? And thank God, I don't even know why I can speculate. There are people within the firm today who started talking to me. And uh, so, yeah, I'm really appreciative, but you're bringing back some, some bad memories too. I'm sorry for that. But in reality, <laughs> it makes sense because a lot of money is on the line. Renaissance has, I believe, profited over a hundred billion dollars. Simon's himself, as of according to Forbes, and maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong. They're putting his estimated net worth over thirty million. And I even read a stat: like billion, the, billion. Oh, excuse me, thirty billion dollars. And the average stat that uh, I believe the average employee has over like fifty million in the company in one way or another. Most likely the medallion fund, but like it's a smaller group relative to like the major hedge funds that we think about. But they just crush it. They absolutely crush it every year, quarter over quarter. They're a, effectively a money printing machine. And I guess I understand the secretive nature because like why risk that type of a deal? A uh, question to you on that, though, is when you started talking to him and we're kind of making the joke of like the godfather, the mob ops. Did he seem like that? Like, was he in a like what's his demeanor? Not only for not just having money but also being like that well-respected by other people who have serious money. So he wouldn't talk to me for a long time. And then eventually we met to talk about talking. <laughs> and what I did was, I don't share this too often, but what I did was in that meeting, I, I showed him on my phone. I'm like, hey, Jim, do you, do you recognize this picture? It was a picture of a, of a house, of a home. And he's like, no, I don't, I don't recognize that. And I'm like, this is your boyhood home in Newton, Massachusetts. And I did that partly to kind of send a message that, that I'm serious and I'm not going away. I went all the way up to Boston. I tracked down his home. I'm talking to people he grew up with. I'm talking to family members. I'm talking to everybody. So I'm not going away. I'm going to write this book, you know, better to work with me than, than not work with me because that's going to be accurate. I, I want it to be as accurate as possible. So eventually he came around and we spent, we, we met about 10 times for about two hours each. And you ask, you know, what he's like and what it's like, what's like dealing with him. The guy's a chain smoker still to this day. You, you know, you got, you're young and, and your audience, I'm sure is young. Back in the day, you had some people who s smoked, but no, no one does it anymore on Wall Street and in the, the business world, corporate America. You, sitting with Jim Simons means sitting there with, with smoke billowing into your face for two hours straight and you just deal with it. You just deal with it because it's Jim Simons who has a chance to, to sit down and talk to him. But um, he's, a, he's a fascinating guy. He, he's one of the few quants, maybe the only quant I've ever met, who does the math and can build the algorithms and he's a world-class mathematician historically. He, he goes down, as, even if he had never invested a dime in the market, he'd go down in history as being one of the greats in, in the world of mathematics. But he's also a guy who will have a drink with you. He drinks gin, gin and tonic and he's funny. He can manage people really well. And that's one of the things about my book I realized after I wrote it. It's as much a, a management kind of book as it is a, a trading book. And because you learn how to, he, he's great at dealing with personalities and, and, and characters and, and, and motivating his employees and, and, and hiring the right people. So he, he's got that other side too. So he's one of the few people that you can actually have an interesting conversation with. Um, in, in, and he's from that, that world, that, that quant world. So yeah, listen, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a skeptical, cynical kind of journalist. I poke holes in, in people's, uh, the, the, the personas, but, but he's a fascinating guy. And, and I came to really appreciate it. He's also very philanthropic. He's trying to do all kinds of really interesting things. He subsidizes teachers, public school teachers in New York city, math and science teachers. He's trying to find the, the, um, some solutions and some treatments to autism. He's a really interesting, fascinating guy. You brought up a lot of great things right there. I think a lot of the times when you hear not only of quants, but of the best quants in the world, the general public, even if they know what that even means in Wall Street, you very much almost start to picture a, a beautiful mind type of a thing where you're just seeing like 
puzzles and code breaking and all that, which is funny because that's literally him to a certain point of he was a code breaker. He did do that. And he is not just a normal mathematician the way we'd think of it in college or high school. Like he is a top tier mathematician. So generally you would assume that the soft skills are non-existent, but I actually would almost put together an argument that that skill set made him more money, his soft skills, rather than his hard skills. I, his hard skills were important to kind of keep the gang together and be able to communicate back and forth. But I, like in his book, you made it very clear, his best skill was acquiring the best people in every little sub niche that he needed. And he just kept the team together. Is that a fair representation? Yeah, it's a really good observation. So someone close to him said to me, uh, Greg, his genius, Jim Simon's genius, is managing genius mm -hmm. and hiring them and creating the incentives and all these other kinds of things that you wouldn't even think of but are necessary. And again, you know, some people could criticize my book. Some people have bought the book and say, yeah, I like the book, but I was looking for the, the secret formula. So these guys, just to take a step back, Medallion Fund, this hedge fund, is on average up 66% a year since the 80s, 66% a year on average. So yeah, again, some people are like, well, I, I want to learn the model. I want to learn the, the formula, the secret to this all. But the secret is how he manages all these geniuses and he always hired them. He creates a unique incentives. He hires them in a different way. All these other kind of things, which as you suggest, are kind of the soft skills. So he can do both. That, and, and there are very few people, I don't think I've met many people in my career at all who could, who could do both of them. I like the whole secret nature part of it or like the almost like the holy grail because I myself when I read it, I was like, oh man, like are we going to like learn what they're doing? And it's interesting to me because right now when people talk about finance and trading, a lot of the times you and I've probably seen it 10 times a day is like this person is 80% accurate, 90% hasn't lost in the past quarter, like kind of almost bombastic high level accuracy, things like that. And it's near the end of the book of one of the workers is quoted. They're like, yeah, we're right about like 50.75% of the time. They couldn't even say 51. That's less of an edge than a casino. But <laughs> it almost point, yeah. rewired my brain of like, oh, oh, okay. Maybe accuracy isn't the thing you want to optimize for. It's like when you're doing it, it, it really shows risk management and you find an edge. Like whenever I start my morning shows, I always joke like dingity, ding, ding, ding. The casino is open. But I'm like, this is a fund that's produced a hundred billion dollars in profit and they literally treat it that way where's our edge and just do it over and over again with proper betting and for those of you listening if you want to look more into the math i believe it's hidden markov chains and then also the kernel method are like allegedly what the two it, it might i'm saying allegedly because it might have developed since the book was written and i'm sure they're always iterating on their math but the beauty of it was on a high level you could explain what they're doing to a young kid, you could be like, oh, there's more of a chance of this happening. So we take that bet over and over and over again. And that's the beauty. It's like not, I don't know, it just, it really struck me as being different than what I was expecting going into the book. So a few observations. First off, you talked about um, Beautiful Mind. And when I've like pitched this to Hollywood and stuff, that's kind of Beautiful Mind crossed by Wall Street kind of thing is the way, the way I look at it. Uh, and so far, no takers on the, uh, from Hollywood. Um, they, they can't get their arms around it. But um, yes, yeah, so, so the fascinating thing, one of the things that surprised me is their math, listen, it's sophisticated, it's sophisticated guys, don't get me wrong, these are people, and we could talk about how they hire differently and their talent is different than everybody else's on Wall Street, I can get into that, but their math isn't quite as sophisticated as you might expect, you would think it's, and, and we talk about hidden markup, they, they, they change, they know all that, they understand it all. They, they use it to some extent, but not really. It's actually not quite as sophisticated. What they do is they look for patterns. That's their thing. Short-term patterns and relationships among investments. They don't go long whatever, gold or, or oil or, or Microsoft shares or whatever, meta. They, it's all about relationships and historical relationships and looking for times when, when it, and it's arbitrage to some extent, it's that are, but it's a much more sophisticated level. But they're looking for relationships of stocks, of investments, groups of investments, and when they get out of whack and when they come back together and when they'll come back together and they take advantage. So it's a whole different type of trading and, and investing and, and speculating that, that, than most other people do. And to, I guess, put the bow on that point before we get into the talent, one of the best examples in the book was when we think of companies of like, oh, company XYZ is going up because of this, that, the other thing. And the workers there, it was truly patterns. And the famous example was how one of the higher ups in the company used Chrysler as an example of like, hey, we see patterns. 
And Chrysler wasn't even trading at that point and it had already been acquired. And it shows just how agnostic of equity the math team was. They're like, no, we just find patterns. It doesn't matter where it is. We find the pattern. If it's statistically relevant, if it's a liquid enough market, we're going to play it. And I, I mean, that example of Chrysler, it was just an absolutely perfect one. Uh, and obviously this is from a higher up mathematician, someone important to the company. So on that note, uh, could you tell us about the talent and the talent acquisition, the retention, anything you know of it when you were writing the book to up to 2019 and maybe anything you've heard from then until now? Sure. So what this firm Renaissance does differently uh, is hiring. And what I mean by that, I'll explain it a few different ways. First is they don't hire for need. Most every other firm in the world, be it Wall Street or otherwise, kind of needs a programmer, needs a trader, needs something, and then they go and hire that person. Renaissance just hires talent, super smart, accomplished people from the academic world only. They don't hire Wall Street kind of people. I can get into that a little bit as well. And they kind of say, you know, come on over. Um, oh, you have no interest in hedge funds? That's fine. Don't look at it like a hedge fund. Look at it like a challenge, an intellectual challenge. And these are people that li like that kind of that, that games. They like these intellectual challenges. That That's what inspires them. It's what juices them. So they, they 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 hire these people and they say just come come spend some time with us go 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 join the group and then these these usually academics they get there and they don't know anything about markets that's the taking a step back that's the paradox behind my whole book the, the people that solved the, the the market as it were or created the, the most successful trading firm in history aren't people like 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 me like I grew up really interested in markets. I would read Barron as a kid, whatever. I was like weird like that and read, read books when I was a kid. I was trading. I was, I was calling a broker from a payphone. I'm, I'm a molder, so I would go to a payphone and, and trade stocks and stuff. These guys at Renaissance don't give a crap about all that. They don't care about companies. Some of them aren't even capitalists. Some of them are socialists. Some of them aren't even sure. And yet they're the ones. That's the crazy thing. The people that have created the greatest investment firm in history don't even care about investing in, in, in business per se. Jim is a unique guy. He, he did. He always was interested in, in trading, investing in, in business and wanted to get rich. He really always wanted to get really, really wealthy. We, we can discuss why. Um, but the, the most people at Renaissance aren't like that. They're like academics. They ran a department some science, some some um, department of science at Stanford or wherever, some 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 top place or PhDs. Like I, I get tours of Wall Street firms, and they're like, "Greg, in that corner are our PhDs." Oh, Greg, over there sit our PhD group of PhD. Really, PhDs? Renaissance is, is mostly PhDs. It's hundreds of PhDs. It's not, and they're not just PhDs. They're people that ran departments, math departments, physics departments, what have you. So they'll they'll hire these people. And then they get over there and they see all these other smart people improving their mo the models. They have one model at the firm, one training model, and they have different inputs and they find different data sources. Anything you can think of, they've thought about and they've purchased. You know, I don't care what it is, any weird data set. They, they, they bought it years ago and they've been analyzing it and they're looking for patterns that, that lead to, to, to profits. So they get over there and I hate to speak so quickly, but I get animated and enthusiastic oh, about this topic. Um, and they get over there and they feel like this kind of um, peer pressure. They're like, well, geez, I don't know shit about trading or investing or, or markets. But I, I, I look for patterns. I'm good at looking for patterns. And a lot of them are, are scientists, et cetera, and hidden patterns, things that aren't picked up. And, and I see ways to kind of improve even incrementally their model. And, and I don't want to be embarrassed. What they do there, and among the things that's very unique, is it's, it's very peer-oriented and collegial. And their presentations are like a few people presenting in, in, in front of um, a dozen other kind of people. And, and you don't want to be embarrassed. And these are super smart people. And you, you, you feel pressure to somehow improve the model just a little bit. And they work really collegially. There's no like silos. On Wall Street, most every firm is siloed. In other words, I got this group here and this group there. And they compete with each other. And if this one gets a better better bonus than it hurts this group and they're very competitive and it works for a lot of firms at renaissance everyone works together there's one model they all work to try to improve it and they're and very very open internally everyone can see the model it's crazy they've got this the greatest firm in history greatest impressive the model produces the best results and yet everyone can see the, the re returns and, and, and the details of the model no other firm google used to be like that too where everyone could see the model but not anymore anymore renaissance is like that so they're very very secretive on the outside but not on, uh, uh, on the outside but not on the inside
on that note, the open air nature, I cracked up in the book when it, at one point the secretaries had access to the model. I don't believe they do nowadays, but like even the fact that at one point they're like literally a hundred percent of the people can see everything going on if you work for this company. And like you said, that's the exact opposite. And it's just another paradox within the paradox of what you alluded to of the best team, the best traders or like the best money producers. I really like how you said that on Wall Street are people who are not traders or investors or money producers. They're effectively a bunch of math nerds who come together and they absolutely crush it. Uh, you were talking about how Mr. Simons uh, very much wanted to just create, generate like high, high levels of wealth. Uh, can you touch on that a bit more of like what was his driving factor? Why did he want to do it? Because from everything I've read, he's much more of like the kind of left-leaning Democrat, like, hey, let's, like, a lot of philanthropic efforts, let's spread out money. So another paradox within the story of many paradoxes. Yeah, he's a unique guy. Like, if you were, I can't speak for you, if, if I was worth a billion or whatever, I'd take it easy. I'd go work, <laughs> I'd go sit on an island, buy an island, buy a sports team for sure. Um, he's not like that. And he is an academic um, a mathematician. Again, he goes down to one of the greatest geometers in history. He led SUNY um, Stony Brook's math department. He, he was a code breaker. And yet that whole time, and he really cares about math. And he's, and now he's gone back to math. Now he's retired from Renaissance. He focuses mostly on math. And yet he always wanted to get really, really rich. So, And he's not embarrassed by that. Like People in his world don't really admit to want in the world of mathematics. They don't really want to acknowledge they want to get wealthy. And most of them, many of them don't. And, and he was different even so he always had like one foot in that world firmly in that world the world of academia and, and mathematics and one fur foot in the real world and, and just trying to get really wealthy and people in my book speculate kind of w why maybe he wanted to have an impact on the world um and maybe maybe it's an ego thing it's not clear like he likes w nice things he's got this huge yacht but i don't think it dominates his his existence. I think he wanted to have an influence on the world. And today he kind of does. I mean, fast forwarding, he's one of the biggest donors to democratic uh, politicians. He's trying to fund all kinds of interesting efforts to find um, the genesis of life and how, how the origins of life, um, autism, as I said, and education, he sponsors all kinds of things. So he's really unique guy in that regard, but right. He was never even like embarrassed that he wanted to get really, really wealthy. He was proud of that fact. Man, that's so interesting. So I believe in 2010, he kind of stepped down from Renaissance. And then I think it was in 2020, 2021, where he was no longer even the chairman. Um, so at this point, to your understanding, I don't know if you currently keep tabs on him. He, he's back to math, like day to day. He's back in the world of academic level math, or is he doing it personal? Or is he doing math for other financial institutions? Like, what's he up to these days? So he does a lot of philanthropy. He's very, very involved in his foundation, hiring people, directing the money where it's going to go. Different, I would, I would say, really impressive, um, incredible um, efforts. Uh, and he does math. He does math with academic colleagues. So kind of there are all kinds of different challenges out there. Things that haven't been proven. Uh, geometry is his area. He goes down again as one of the greatest geometers. Um, so, so he's kind of involved in, in that world and in politics as well. Those kind of things. But he, and he still keeps a tab on his firm. He's still the biggest shareholder and, and, and equity holder of his firm. So he makes a fortune each year from the firm. But he, Peter Brown, who I write about in my book, he runs things day to day. And he's an interesting character in his own right. One thing you touched on in your book that just it did not play out in real time yet was how there could be like a tax issue, a tax liability issue. And then a couple of years later, we actually got the conclusion of it and had something to do with, yeah, Renaissance was crushing it, but they took a tax advantage, I believe, of short-term profits somehow got marked as long-term, so there was less of a tax burden. Uh, did you follow up on that lawsuit? Are you knowledgeable with it? Yeah, so as you suggest, they, they um, push the envelope when it comes to tax strategies. And, you know, one with I, I like writing about gray characters. I mean, they're not all heroes or, or, or villains in, in life. And you can really make the argument that here you are, Jim Simons, you, you do so much good and um, you believe in, in, in try to help all these good causes well and, and you're helping you say the the government should be should be moving in a certain direction you're also hurting the government in that you are not paying the full taxes that you should or your, your firm isn't so they were very aggressive and it, 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 they thought it was legal and it turns out it wasn't so basically they were shifting that they you can read about it in the book a little bit but yeah they got caught for that and they had to pay pay billions in fines so yeah i'm not make, making these guys out to necessarily heroes they're good people and they're bad people and they're sort of 
great people, but they're all interesting people. I personally thought you were actually really balanced with it because you actually pointed out various times where he seemed to do one thing, whether it's making math for America and supporting it, not only financially, but just with his platform. And then he was talking about how I need to give money to these mathematicians, especially in New York, so they stay there. But then yet some of the best math minds he would recruit out of that world to work for his company. So like it is many, many paradoxes. And that's probably the title of this talk is just the paradox of Jim Simons. With that, did you ever present that directly to him? Were you ever like, hey, I see you doing this, but then you're also doing this. Like, how does that add up in your mind? Or did you never really have the opportunity to like show them his almost like conflicting actions? I did. I did. I said, I pointed out to Jim, I'm like, on the one hand, you are subsidizing school teachers, um, public school teachers in New York City, I think maybe New York State, um, so that they don't go and leave to to work at places like hedge funds, <laughs> like your own. And meanwhile, you're hiring mathematicians and scientists from schools all over the, the country. And, and um, as is often the case when I point out these paradoxes or hypocrisies from the uh, in, in the people I write about, they don't see it. <laughs> they, they just uh, doesn't register. He didn't really put two and two together. I, I, he didn't see it that way. I mean, I'm sure on some level they did, but he didn't want to really comment on or own up to it. I don't, I, that should be the worst thing he does, right? So there, there, there are much worse things in, in, in life. And I do think he's uh, net, net a good person um, who is very charitable and um, – hasn't really set out to hurt people, what have you. But yeah, there's a lot of a lot of gray there. Yeah, I, I guess as you alluded to, as with so many people, so many aspects of life, with Renaissance, Rentech, Medallion, all of that, the hyper levels of success. If you had to bet, will that continue into the future? Because we're now seeing the birth of well, they were there, but like they're also getting bigger. And I'm talking about um, AQR, Two Sigma, DE Shaw, Citadel. There are now many other major quant players. Are they going to take away from the pie of Renaissance or is Renaissance still just operating in like the same sport, but maybe just a different league and still kind of doing their own thing? It's a great question. So I'm a cynical, skeptical journalist. Um, I kept waiting for them to blow it. And frankly, you know, here I am writing this book. Uh, part of me is like, Jesus, what if they blow up while I'm writing this book? That would not be good for the, for the book. I wasn't like, like rooting for them, but I was a little concerned. Um, and yet they keep killing it. Now you could argue that it's not quite; a, they're not quite as successful, as successful as they used to be. So last year, I think they were up about twenty in the medallion fund, and the market was down twenty. Is that uh, my? Do I, re I recall I, that accurately? Something from, like that. Yeah, my so, research. Yeah. Like we would all love to be up twenty last year when the market was down twenty. That said, they usually do much better than twenty. Again, I'm up sixty six percent. They're up sixty six percent a year on average. That's before. If, the fees they charge themselves. So let's say 40 something percent uh, on average, something like 37. Anyway, they're a little bit, they're not doing quite as well as they used to. And, and frankly, people internally who I still talk to, they don't know. They think, they wonder if maybe they're losing their edge a little bit. They're not sure. The crazy thing is they're so secretive and they're so apart from everybody else on Wall Street. They're out long, in Long Island. Physically, they're, they're apart, but they also don't hire people from Wall Street People don't leave and go to work on Wall Street. I can explain sort of like why that helps them and this, their own ecosystem. So they don't really know w how they compare with, with others, if others are catching up or not. They, they worry. They look over their shoulder. They, they are concerned. And, and it, in some ways, it's inevitable, but um, they have continued to do much better than everybody else. So, so part of their advantage has gone away. So one of their advantages always was data. And they were early in the in collecting data. And we're talking about in the 80s, they were going down to the Fed and taking down data, pricing um, histories on things like gold and other commodities and trying to clean the data. Before people were doing that, there was this thing called um, data cleaning, which, which wasn't a concept back then, which they were the first to do. They were the first in, in like everything. Um, AI, I mean, they were doing machine learning uh, or before anybody, decades ago, now everyone's caught up, but they were the, the, the pioneers in, in quantitative, in, in, in the quant world for sure, but um, in AI, AI, machine learning, and other kinds of things, and alg predictive algorithms, etc. So one that some of those advantages have gone away. They, they were acquiring data that no one cared about, but now everyone wants data, everyone collects data, everyone cleans data. So yeah, their data goes back hundreds of years, centuries, what have you, but other people can get that kind of stuff. So I don't think they have the same kind of advantage 
when it comes to that. They still have a talent advantage, I would argue, but there's a lot of smart PhDs out there trying to compete with them. They what I think r- remains is their is is the organization and how they hire better and they work together better than everybody else. The kind of the, the points I made earlier. They're much more collegial. They're more open. They're transparent. Um, there are other kind of advantages they still have, but not as many as they used to. In the process of creating this book and just all the extensive research that you had to go through to even make it and write it, did it change your own outlook on actively trading or investing like at all? Did you actually switch up your own style or was it more like, I guess, different? You're like, nope, I'm still going to do mine. And this is just a cool story that I follow. Well, I can't do much. I work at the Wall Street Journal, so I'm limited in terms of my trading. The, mm-hmm. the journal limits us. Uh, but but it, it changed my view on, on, on life in some ways because I became a believer in having a systematic approach to, to decision making. So if you look at all the, the great companies out there, there's some systematic approach as opposed to just sort of using your intuition and winging it and uh, using, using your judgment. And you know, it's true of other important jobs in life. Let's say you're a pilot. They they instituted this thing a number of years ago, but it's really helped in terms of a checklist. So yeah, I'm a veteran pilot, but I still, before I take off, I've got to have this, do go through this checklist. And other, maybe surgeons as well, I think maybe as well. And that's a systematic approach. Um, others kind of tried to em- embrace that too. And, and I'm a storyteller, but I have become more of a believer in having a systematic approach as opposed to kind of stories and hearing in and and using your intuition and um, relying on anecdotes and having some sort of systematic approach to to life and and to trading, I think is really valuable. And frankly, it, it scares me that some of the bigger decisions in life, you know, by the Fed, by by presidents, prime ministers, etc., are made by people just sort of kind of still winging it. And one of the lessons from the Jim Simons and Renaissance experience is the importance, I don't care who you are as an investor or somebody else, and just sort of having sort of a checklist and having some systematic approach that you can rely on. It doesn't always work, but it seems to do much better than just sort of trying to figure it out along the way and using your judgment and, and intuition and interviewing CEOs and deciding. A lot of traditional investors will kind of meet with management and mm, they seem like they're good managers. They, I, I really trust them. I've got. I've been doing this for a long time, the journal. They get fooled all the time, even the most um, sophisticated investors and I've written about M- Madoff and, and, and others. So that's one of the conclusions I've come to from, from the research on, on this book. I think that's super insightful. To wrap this up, a bit of a fun question for you, if you will. If you could wave a magic wand right now and get the same level of access or maybe even more and do a similar almost biography on someone, uh, who would it be? Like Warren Buffett, Ray Dalio, Ken Griffin? Like, who is there something in your mind that you're like, if the stars aligned and you could land it, you would love to do another story? Or did this experience take so much out of you? You're like, I just don't have that type of like arduous push in me anymore. No, I'm on to the next. I'm actually uh, starting a, a, a new book about some of the uh, greatest investments slash trades in history and telling the story of how they evolved. Um, one of those characters is Stan Druckenmiller, and okay. he's he worked with George Soros for a long time. He ran, has been running his own uh, enterprise firm and, and funds, and um, he's more of a fundamental investor. And yet he's he's a technician too. He loves technical analysis. That's always kind of been something that he used to complement his fundamental research. And he's historically one one of the greats too. And I, I like to learn from all these guys. And a lot of those guys. Um, as opposed to Renaissance, which tries to get it right 50.7% of the time, like you said, those guys look for, for uh, a fat pitch. And, I'm a, and I've written a book about John Paulson and the trade he did. It's called The Greatest Trade Ever is that book. And he did The Greatest Trade Ever. And that's like a fat pitch. So there are two ways. You know, there's not just one way of making money on Wall Street. You could do the more quantitative kind of approach, but you could also do um, the, the approach of guys like like Druckenmiller and Miller and John Paulson and some others, which is look for a fat pitch in George Soros, and then you try you take a big big ass swing on that one when, when you got it lined up, and that's one of their big arguments. You can go 
months, days, weeks, years, maybe without a, a huge, op- but when you see that one opportunity, you better F and hit that out of the park. So that's another approach to investing, which I find interesting. No, I absolutely love that. And I'm when, as soon as that book comes out, you definitely at least have one of uh, one sale to me. Very excited for that. Uh, this has been a great conversation. So for the audience members that are interested in whether your piece is for the Wall Street Journal or your new books, what's the best way to see what you're up to and to follow you? Um, I'm very active on uh, Twitter and on LinkedIn. Uh, I think I'm like G Zuckerman. You can find me uh, and on LinkedIn. And I love hearing, you know, constructive criticism from from readers. You know, a lot of my best sources are people like, yeah, I, I read your article or I read the book and I liked it, but you forgot X, Y, Z. And then I'm open to, you know, improving and, and, and learning. So I'd love to hear from people and um, be, it, be it constructive criticism or, or any other kind of criticism or, or even compliments I'll take. <laughs> That's absolutely awesome. Folks, for everyone listening, I'll put all those links in the description below. So it's just one click away. But for me and on behalf of the audience, seriously, we appreciate your time. This book is awesome. If you're listening to this, folks, I promise you, you're going to love this book. It blew my mind. It'll definitely restructure the way you look at the markets. But uh, the fact that you dedicated your time and willing to speak with us, that's absolutely awesome. So best of luck. And we truly appreciate it. So thank you. See you later. It was a lot of fun. Nice to, nice to be in touch and nice to be in touch with your audience as well.